Good morning. I'm your last presentation before lunch. Um, David Ross from Atlanta VA Rehab R&D Center and Gary, Gary W. Kelly, uh, who works for Looktail. He's a human factors engineer, designer, and writer, and I could go on. He was actually the founder of the VA Center where I work now. Um, and thank you for, uh, for bringing us here to do this, do this presentation. Um, I want to take a slightly different tack on things. I'm going to show you a movie in just a minute. I have no slides, so we have plenty of time to just kind of describe things of what, what I'm trying to do. The last time I gave a presentation here, am I loud enough? Is this louder? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the last time I gave a presentation here, I talked for an hour about what's called neuroplasticity or brain plasticity. And the point of that presentation basically was to say that you know, a person who loses their vision has a visual cortex, it's one third of their brain, and this visual cortex, as they lose their vision, or after they lose their vision, has the potential to greatly increase the effectiveness of other senses and, and, and the way the person acts and reacts and responds to their environment. For instance, there's something called, uh, well, I did a demonstration where I put a, a, a glass on the table over here and I talked for a while and I reached back and I picked up the glass without looking. Now that took practice. I actually have to admit I took practice doing that, but this is called proprioception. There are other senses that can be used very effectively if your brain is pressed to be able to do that, and if you practice, and if you have an incentive to go forth and, and work on these things. Um, so what I wanted to do as a different approach to looking at technology, I have a wayfinding technology I developed, and I developed it with Gary because I wanted to have the perspective of someone who was blind, but also who has a great background in human factors design and engineering from Georgia Tech. And to bring that into the, the way we developed the, the interaction between the human, per, the human user and the technology. And so as you look at this video of the technology we developed, it's not perfect, and it's, you, you, you've seen a lot of wayfinding, wayfinding technologies already this morning. It's built on RFID and is in, in collaboration with a company called Interface, by the way, that makes floors. And let me start the video. I, I will describe it as we go along. The Atlanta VA Rehabilitation Research and Development Center of Excellence for Visual and Neurocognitive Rehabilitation presents Making Indoor Spaces Accessible Using Radio Frequency Identification, RFID, Floors. For veterans who are visually impaired, the homogeneous nature of indoor environments can make navigation especially difficult as to the tip of a white cane, one long hallway with doors on both sides is basically the same as any other. Access requires more than the ability to use a cane to avoid obstacles. Useful access implies the ability to find specific destinations and things, offices, clinics, pharmacy, elevators, restrooms, etc. Well-meaning assistance from sighted people can be unreliable at best and is not a very independent way to navigate. Braille signs provide the only means of finding specific location. However, using these signs for wayfinding is a very tedious process, often resulting in fear, a sense of dependence, and frustration. To provide useful access to VA medical centers and facilities and increase our veterans' level of confidence and self-respect, those with a visual impairment must be provided with a means of reliably and independently finding their own way around indoors. They need a system that provides the equivalent to information used by sighted persons. By happenstance, Interface Floor was facing the same problem. They developed an environmentally green floor and a robot to clean it. But their robot cleaners needed a reliable way to find their way around large buildings, making sure they fully cleaned every tile. To solve this problem, Interface created a smart floor using radio frequency identification, RFID, tags. Adhered to the bottom of each floor tile, these RFID tags contain a tiny microchip programmed with their location. Each floor tile knows exactly where it is in the building and provides this information to anyone with an RFID tag reader. 
Taking advantage of this, Atlanta VA investigators designed an RFID reader antenna that easily attaches to any white cane. Once an RFID floor is installed, using this RFID tag reader and a digitized building directory, veterans will be able to easily find their way around the maze of hallways found in most VA medical centers. Matter fountain. The parts of this system include an antenna mounted on a cane, the RFID reader box, the antenna is connected via a flexible wire to the reader box, a smartphone, the RFID reader box sends the received RFID tag information to a smartphone using a wireless Bluetooth connection. <coughs> A wireless bone conduction headset. It is important not to cover the person's ears so he or she can hear important sound cues in the environment. The bone conduction headset does not cover the ears, but instead vibrates the bone just in front of the ears to create sound. In operation, the RFID antenna sends out pulses of radio frequency energy. This energy powers the RFID tags in the floor just in front of the person. These tags then respond, transmitting their information back to the RFID antenna. <coughs> there are two modes of operation. Look around. Exit door, 28 feet. Water fountain, 25 feet. Med room, 25 feet. Reception desk, 18 feet. And find. Selecting find in look around mode, the system directs you to the destination you're pointing toward. Selecting men's room, 25 feet. This sound is heard when the person is moving in the right direction to the chosen destination. This sound is heard when the person is beginning to veer off track and stops when the person is back on track. It plays on either the left or right ear, indicating that the person should move more to that side. Then, when the person is 10 feet from the destination, they receive a countdown of feet to the destination. 10, 7, 4, 1, 1. When walking down hallways, the system describes points of interest along the hall. Eagle's Nest Hall of Fame on right. Trophy Showcase on left. You can also select to find a specific location that is not in view and be guided through hallways to that destination. Take first hall to right, 30 feet. Turn right into hallway, men's room, 75 feet. The cost of placing braille signs on just 10 doors along this 120-foot hallway is $350, while the cost for adding RFID tags when installing a floor is less than $100. Clearly, this small additional expense provides a great deal of value. Thus, by installing inexpensive RFID technology, we can afford to better the lives of veterans with visual impairment, making every VA medical center and someday every government building fully accessible. Okay, so that was our little promo, actually for the VA because we were trying to get funding. <laughs> but you got the idea. So, um, the reason I brought Gary into it was to work with us in terms of the interface that you saw us using. And one thing that uh, we noticed as we were using the, the look around type interface was that uh, many, vet, many of the, uh, the persons we were, you know, who came to test it would get, go past it before it could say something. And so uh, that triggered the development of a, of a vibrate, vibrating, using the cell phone, it would vibrate as you passed it. So you knew you passed it even if it didn't say something, and you could come back to it and check it. Um, but, you know, these are all issues related to the interface that many people are discussing, but one of the things I want to look at, and we've been talking about with Gary, is 
how does this affect the actual neural processing within the brain of the person? How can we best encourage that person to enhance their skills instead of replacing their skills? There's negative plasticity as well as positive plasticity. Someone who's just losing their central vision, for instance, their brain will fill in what it thinks is in that space. People who are losing their central vision may or may not be able to trust what they think they're seeing in front of them because of this. They may even have what they think of as, you know, as hallucinations in some cases. Um, some people will say, well, I thought I saw an elephant when I walked down the street, but I knew there couldn't be an elephant there. Um, maybe or maybe not. So the thing is, I would call that a kind of negative plasticity in terms of the, be the person being able to function. How can we discredit what the brain is doing at that point? You know, there, there's a process called top-down and bottom-up. There's a the top-down process is a process where you walk into a room and you get essentially a gist of the room. If there's no bottom-up process filling in the details of that room, you may hallucinate things being there that aren't actually there because your top-down process is suggesting certain things that if they're not counteracted by the bottom-up feeding of, of detailed information will, will become what you think is there. People who are well, I can go on. I don't have a lot of time. But the whole, pro the whole point is, we, I and Gary are looking at ways to build the interface of these technologies in an interactive fashion so the person can get a sense of what's really there, can, can check, to find out with, with a bottom-up process when it's needed, when the top-down as assumptions of coming into a space are not adequate. And uh, Gary, I'll let you take over because we're running out of time. Okay. 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 Mic in your hand. okay. Got it. Right Yes. Uh, a little closer. Okay. I think that'll work. Everyone here? Yes. Okay. Good. The concepts that David's bringing out, I think, are becoming vital to the future of human factors engineering. It used to be, when we talked about human factors, everybody was concerned about physical factors. They were concerned about cognitive factors. And they were concerned, so psychophysical. But it's only been fairly recently they even looked at values, emotions, and other kinds of psychological factors. And now we're saying we have compelling evidence to consider those because we talk about positive plasticity and negative plasticity. You have to start looking at the effects of what this will have on a person's life in a longer term than just one experiment. The <clears throat> kinds of things that we're, we're concerned about that we saw in working together with Looktel was fundamental to evolving a new concept that the technologies you implement and the things we do need to reinforce positive plasticity so that when the technology fails for any reason, fails to support the person, that the person will still have be no worse off than if they never had the technology. Okay, now that's a novel concept, but think about it. So if you're using a mobility aid and it, and it down the street as a travel aid does not work, the person should be able to function with their normal skills in an equal manner. They'll miss the augmentative information, but it should be augmentative. It should not be so critical that they feel they cannot function without it. So we're, we're urging a, a fresh look at, at each test and each one of the evaluations we all do to see that we're supporting plasticity in a positive manner so that we are, in fact, adding to the person's skills that they would have to use if the technology weren't there. Are you, with your technology, increasing their awareness of spatial areas, uh, allowing them to expand the use of their brain to do cognitive mapping more efficiently and more effectively, encouraging them to use information from the environment to override the tendency to top-down process, to uh, imagine that it's there, even if it isn't, or erroneously imagine it. Most mobility errors can be tracked back to people making an assumption about where, where something is or where they are in relation to the environment that may not be valid. And O&M instructors throwing up their hands and saying, no, wait a minute, pay attention to, no. and for good reason. So we want to encourage those processes, and we need to encourage them early on. So as we have a new generation, older ones like, like the speakers here, <laughs> who are now having to adjust to changing life, we have to remember 
that the majority of people who will use the technology being presented here today are not blind yet. They will be in the next 10 to 20 years. So if we're going to deal with them in, as a society, as a culture, we're going to have to look at how we can support what's going to be happening to them. And we're suggesting that we need to look at the long-term view of promoting their independence without your technology. At the same time, you're augmenting what they're doing in order to do it better. Okay, I think we better take questions. Okay. Questions. Questions. Ellie, I'll be right there. Yeah. Do you want me to shout? Can I throw you? Yeah. You can throw. I, well, I promise to catch. <laughs> I better duck. I'll duck. Oh no, this is the wrong phone. I apologize. This doesn't work. Oh, yeah. James. All right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. We are inventing very complicated ways to. Yeah, that's it, it, it's, it's relevant to my question about uh, not using the technology. Um, so, I mean, this idea that you're selling at the end about uh, uh, getting people to be. Uh, uh, learning while they use this technology is a, a great idea, but I haven't heard from you any shred of direction to achieve that. And I know that using GPS is making all of us substantially less aware of our environment when we drive. Um, I, you know, I come to uh, the Bay Area for three years now on a regular basis, and for 20 years before, since I'm using GPS, I lost the knowledge I had of the Mountain View area that I had for many years before, and I, I don't see where the use of this technology could uh, do the opposite. So I'm interested in any anything, any direction in that regard. Don't give us any questions. So could you clarify how you lost? How do we, I lost yeah. this? Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, so sure. I um, so I, I, this may be uh, individual to me, but I noticed that I lose maps. If I go back to my uh, uh, childhood town now, um, I, I can go through the, the city, but there are portions of the maps of the city that are, are sort of vague. They're, they're missing. I, I, I know what's behind, or uh, I could go through and get to another place in the city, but I have areas that I don't remember anymore, so they, they fail from memory. The same thing goes here, that I, I used to pay attention, I drove in Mountain View area, I, I knew my way around the area, I had a map. Now I have GPS, I go, you know, the, I get an option to choose of three ways, and I chose the one that usually is shorter, and it takes me through another way I'm not familiar with, and I, I don't learn it. I, next time, I get another one, and I'm thinking, should I take this or go to the one I know? And I, I choose the GPS option that looks good for the moment because that's, that's uh, efficient. So I, I don't build. Right, 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 right. And you probably don't refresh the maps that you have in mind. I so don't, you tend to I don't, yes, yeah. exactly. So I they mean, go away. Yeah. This is the geo equivalent of somebody getting a calculator and forgetting the <laughs> Absolutely. It is equivalent to that. Do you guys have an answer to this? Yes. We, we do. <laughs> We're kind of joking that we could have a debate about this all afternoon, uh, but you know it, it's obviously not going to be answered simply. But I'll I'll, I'll dare give a, a somewhat simplistic summary. We do know some of the elements of what it requires to have independent orientation and mobility. We know that you need a good cognitive map. So when you are developing a technology that reinforces my having a better cognitive map you've already taken one step toward giving me greater independence and mobility with or without the technology. When you give me something that gives me orientation on that cognitive map in a way that's supportive and not replacing what I should be doing anyway, you may be doing another. And when you help me <coughs> confirm or verify that what I'm already doing is correct, then you are definitely giving positive reinforcement to my mobility skills. So in, in those principles, I will use those. I will give one example from my personal experience where I used a GPS product to do this. It's Looktails, it's in development. 
I set breadcrumbs, as we call it, along a walking route that runs along the river in Albuquerque and mapped out points along that route. And then from quite a distance away, actually four or five miles, I followed that route and looked at my relationship now where I'm standing with respect to where the river route ran. And I got a surprise. That thing turns in several places. And I never had understood how it moved east and then came back southwest until I did that. So it changed my whole map of part of the city that I had in my head. Because now I could see in, in here in, for myself how the route really ran and understand better the, the differences along it. So that's an, an example of how GPS can be used in a positive manner. We have the last question. Noel Runyon, and actually Gary answered some, uh, some of what I was going to say. I mean, at, I think clearly different how sighted people can depend on a GPS as a crutch and lose their memory of, of their map that they had. But for blind people who didn't have that memory of the map to lose in the first place usually, it greatly enhances our map uh, and so it doesn't become the kind of crutch tool. Thank you very much. All right, I think we would like to thank you again for your time.